Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today. For those who are joining us online, thank you as well. Today's book talk is co-sponsored by UC San Diego Library and the 21st Century China Center. My name is Si Chen. I'm the Chinese Studies Librarian at UC San Diego. It is my great pleasure to welcome Mr. Mike Chinoy and also Professor Paul Pickowitz to our library. Before I introduce our guests, I would like to share a happy coincidence that is related to today's book talk. And it also explains why there is a slight show of 1970s China running in outside our event room. Um, long story short, around the same time that 21st century, 21st century China Center contacted Mr. Chinoy for this book talk, our library acquired a slides collection that is brought back by a group of Americans who traveled to China in 1973 on a tour organized by the New York-based newspaper called The Guardian. We found out that Mr. Chinoy is in many photos in the slides collection, so we didn't plan it at all. I don't know if you recognize him in three photos of the slideshow. If you haven't had a chance to see it, the collection has been published on our library's um, digital collections webpage. So the collection's name is 1973 Guardian uh, Tour. Um, so this encounter, early encounter with China was also recorded in Mr. Uh, Chinoy's 1999 book, China Life. I want to thank uh, Mr. Evan Taylor and Professor Joseph Hu, who are with us online today for donating the slides collection. I also want to thank Ms. Alice Rothschild, the photographer, for letting us publish the collection. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Paul Pekowitz, who will be moderating today's Q&A, and also he will formally introduce uh, Mr. Chinoy. Professor Paul Pekowitz is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of History at UC San Diego and inaugural holder of the UCSD Endowed Chair in Modern Chinese History. He has produced 20 books, including Chinese Village and Socialist State, which details state exploitation at the village level. Another book, China on Film, A Century of Exploration, Confrontation, and a Controversy, examines the history of Chinese cinema. He has won three distinguished teaching awards of UC San Diego. Professor Paul Pickwist also graduated 38 PhD students. He has held visiting appointments at Oxford, National University of Singapore, University of Edinburgh, University of Heidelberg, East China Normal University, City University of Hong Kong, Echo Normal, Superior, Hong Kong Institute of Education, and Swartzman College of Tsinghua University. He's an associate producer of the documentary film, China in Revolution, 1911 to 1949, and The Mao Years, 1949 to 1976. Professor Pickowitz was honored by the German government in 2016 with a Humboldt Research Award for Lifetime Accomplishments in Research and Teaching. Thank you, Professor Pickowitz, for being our moderator today. Finally, I, wa I want to thank our library team and also the 21st Century China Center teams for providing the crucial support for this event. Thank you. Thanks, Xi, and uh, welcome to everyone. It's great to see so many people out here. Um, Mike Chinoy and I first met in 1977 in Hong Kong when his long and distinguished journalistic career started with the CBS and ABC TV news bureaus in Hong Kong way back then. Uh, although I was an academic, I really, really enjoyed hanging out, I think that's the right word, with journalists. And thanks to Mike, I got to know and befriended 
such well-known Hong Kong-based U.S. journalists as uh, Linda Matthews, uh, Richard Bernstein, Jay Matthews, uh, and Melinda Liu. Uh, Mike and these friends were great fun. As an academic trying to get some feel for their world, uh, it was very, very enjoyable. We all loved Hong Kong, uh, and uh, we shared many adventures uh, over uh, over the years in the in the late 1970s. Um, with little or no direct access to China in those days, uh, Mike and these other journalists were always looking for a fresh source. Uh, since I traveled frequently to China at that time, uh, Mike would sometimes do video interviews with me in his apartment upon my return to Hong Kong. Uh, after I paid a visit to the Democracy Wall in Beijing in August 1979, uh, Mike and the others urged me to write my own stories and publish them anonymously as an unnamed correspondent uh, in venues like the Farsin Economic Review in Hong Kong. So I valued their encouragement and uh, through Mike and the others, I got a pretty good feeling for the many difficulties uh, facing journalists whose job it was to cover China. Uh, Mike then spent 24 years, 24 years, as a foreign correspondent for CNN, as CNN's first Beijing bureau chief, and after that, as CNN's Hong Kong bureau chief. From 2001 to 2006, he served as CNN's senior Asia correspondent responsible for coverage throughout the Asia Pacific region. Uh, he covered firsthand, uh, I mean, the list is so long, I'm not gonna cover everything. He covered firsthand many major events, including of course, the 1989 Tiananmen crisis. And as a result of his splendid work, he won many awards, including an Emmy, two DuPonts and a Peabody. Since 2006, Mike has been a non-resident senior fellow at the U.S. Uh, China Institute at USC, our neighbor up north. His many books include uh, China Live, uh, People Power, and The Television Revolution. I brought a copy of that with me. Uh, and uh, uh, Meltdown, the inside story of the North Korean nuclear crisis. Uh, and a surprise, perhaps to some of you, a book called Are You With Me? Kevin Boyle and the Rise of the Human Rights Movement. So among many other things, he's an expert on Ireland uh, and, its, uh, and its history, uh, modern history. So um, Mike is here today to talk about his latest book, an amazing volume entitled Assignment China, an Oral History of American Journalists in the People's Republic. I've read every word of it. Uh, it will be for sale out there when we're done. Um, you better get in line early because I think they're going to sell out. Uh, it's a book that is connected to a wonderful documentary film series on the same topic produced by Mike. So please welcome Mike Chinoy. Thanks very much, Paul. It's, it's, it's great to be here. It's shocking to believe it was almost 50 years ago that we were hanging out in Hong Kong trying to figure out what was going on across the border uh, in China. Um, the, Paul mentioned that he'd like to hang out with journalists. And I think one of, one of the important uh, uh, contributions that I hope I can make with this book, Assignment China, is to give people a sense sort of how journalists work and think and and what they do as they try to make sense uh, of China. And what I'd like to do today is to sort of talk about some of the, uh, the issues that are raised uh, in the book and some of the experiences that the people who, uh, whose accounts feature in the book um, uh, had. And to begin with, I wanna fast forward back even before Paul and I met to 1973, when I made my first uh, trip to China. Um, the collection of uh, photographs that she referred to that's out, out there uh, is from that trip. Uh, it was with a student group, and that's me uh, with a lot more hair and none of it gray um, in the summer of 1973. And one of the places we went on this trip was called the Wusan People's Commune outside Shenyang in Northeast China. And that's where we met a guy who was presented to us as a sort of model Maoist peasant. Uh, named Yu Ke Xin. 
Uh, and after getting a briefing from commune officials about how great everything was, uh, we had uh, we broke into small groups and I ended up with a couple of uh, the other students having lunch with him in his home. And it was a wonderful meal. It was a rare chance to have relatively unstructured, unsupervised interaction with a sort of ordinary Chinese person. And it remained for me one of the highlights of the trip. So 20 years later, 1993, as CNN's first Beijing bureau chief, I got the idea of retracing my 1973 trip with the idea of if I could find out what happened to some of the people and places that I'd visited in 73, it'd be a good way to sort of convey how China had changed during that time. So I managed to track Yu Kuxin down and I discovered that he was now running a tractor repair shop. He'd moved on from the ramshackle building uh, home where he lived. He had a nice apartment with a television set. He was clearly a beneficiary of the market-oriented reforms that Deng Xiaoping had introduced in the intervening 20 years. But as soon as the local officials who'd arranged this trip uh, were out of earshot, uh, you confessed to me that almost everything that I had seen in 1973 was an illusion. He said that, in fact, conditions at the time were terrible, that he and his family were lucky to eat meat once a month, and that the meal that I had so enjoyed had actually been trucked in by local officials the day before in order to impress the foreigners. And to me, this underscores a central theme in any discussion about the history and experiences of the foreign correspondents who have covered China, and that is the challenge of finding the truth in a vast, complicated history with a, a, a long a tradition of uh, uh, distrust of outsiders, a secretive and authoritarian political system. This, by the way, is Joe Kahn, who in the 1990s and early 2000s covered China for first the Wall Street Journal and then the New York Times. Today, he's the editor-in-chief of the New York Times, and he's one of the more, one, more than 100 journalists whose interviews make up the heart of Assignment China. In thinking about this question, the stakes really couldn't be higher because over the decades, the American media, including in, in this photograph, Evan Osnos of The New Yorker, have played a critical role, profoundly influencing US views of China, as well as the policies of successive American governments. Moreover, given the reach or clout of American news organizations like The New York Times or The Washington Post or the networks, CNN, or the wire services like the Associated Press, um, that has meant that the uh, who are who whose coverage is uh, used all over the world. That has given the American media a kind of disproportionate impact in shaping how people all over the world understand or misunderstand China. But for many consumers of news, the way in which the information that you see on the, your TV screen or read in the newspaper or listen to on the radio, read online, um, actually gets there remains a mystery. Few people really understand what goes into uh, the reporting, the writing, and the transmitting of news. This, by the way, is John Pomfret, who in 1989 uh, was a reporter for the Associated Press, and that's uh, he's standing behind Murakai Shi and Wang Dan, two of the student leaders of the Tiananmen Square protest, and he later became a very distinguished correspondent covering China for uh, the New York Times. As any journalist or anybody who really knows anything about journalism will agree, however, the process decisively shapes any news report. And I'll talk more about that as we go along. So that today, with China emerging as a global superpower and its relations with the U.S. more uh, strained than at any time in the last 50 years, I would argue that understanding the people who have covered China for the American media and how they've done so is crucial to help everyone understand the news they're watching or reading and providing that understanding is the central goal of Assignment China. The story of the journalists in Assignment China begins with the triumph of Mao Zedong's communist revolution in 1949, at which point virtually all American and other Western uh, journalists were forced to leave the country. Indeed, when Mao proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic in Tiananmen Square, on October 1st, 1949, not a single American correspondent was there to cover the story. For most of the decades that followed, or for at least for the, the, the most of the three decades that followed, American reporters had little choice but to cover China from outside the mainland, most notably in the then British colony of Hong Kong, which is where Paul and I met back in the 70s. 
The China watchers, as they became known, relied primarily on the official Chinese media, which they monitored religiously for clues, as well as the occasional interview with refugees or the very infrequent visitors uh, to the mainland with whom they could speak. Bernard Kalb, who sadly passed away a couple of months ago at the age of 100, was based in Hong Kong in the late 50s for the New York Times and then joined CBS News in Hong Kong for much of the 1960s. And he offers a sort of interesting sense of what being a China watcher involved. Oop. Where's the sound that worked before? How do we get information about China? We got bits and pieces. We read everything we could. We put the mosaic of pieces together and try to extract some narrative about what was happening in China. But this was bits and pieces journalism. It was, in fact, a frustrating beat, especially when China was convulsed with upheavals like Chairman Mao's Cultural Revolution uh, in the late 1960s, which journalists couldn't witness for American journalists couldn't witness for themselves. In fact, it was not until President Richard Nixon's historic trip in early 1972 that the door began to open. At that time, China had been off limits for so long that many journalists, including network heavyweights like Dan Rathers of the CBS News, felt that making this trip was like going to, uh, into outer space. The leading person born in in the wake of the Nixon trip, China did become slightly more open to Americans, and U.S. news organizations began gradually to get a little bit more access. This is Ted Koppel of ABC News and cameraman John Lauer in China in 1973, the year of my first visit. But it wasn't until the U.S. and China established formal diplomatic relations in 1979 that American news organizations were finally allowed to open bureaus in Beijing. The interest in China was enormous. When Deng Xiaoping, who by then had established himself as the senior leader, um, visited the U.S. and wore a cowboy hat at a rodeo in Texas, um, this kind of cemented this, this notion of Deng as I don't know what you call it, the cuddly communist, and China as an attractive strategic and economic partner for the United States. The economic reforms which Deng then initiated heightened this perception which was fueled by the cascade of stories that the newly arrived American correspondents did about the changes underway. Jim Laurie opened the ABC News Bureau. You go back and you look at the programming on ABC and NBC and CBS uh, in 1979, that is very much reflected. China opening up. Every little uh, innovation that occurred in the late 70s that were part of the reform program that Deng was outlining were seized upon. The first private restaurant, the first private car, the first of this, the first. It was all a series of firsts. What followed were several decades in which the People's Republic began to be uh, increasingly accessible to American and other foreign journalists, although there were always obstacles and limitations. When I became CNN's first Beijing bureau chief in 1987, for example, the official regulations required that you get permission 10 days in advance before you could make any trip outside Beijing, such as this visit to Lhasa, Tibet, that I took with my, ca my camera woman and sound man in 1988. Plus, anywhere you went, you had to be accompanied by a government minder. Moreover, contact with ordinary Chinese remained difficult. Melinda Liu, a Chinese-American who opened the Newsweek Bureau because she was ethnic Chinese, could dress like a local and uh, sometimes escape the scrutiny of security personnel and get out and mingle with ordinary citizens. But the encounters the journalists had were often very fraught. Fox Butterfield of the New York Times, for example, met a woman who spoke candidly about sexual values in China. He wrote an article in which he didn't name her and tried to disguise her identity, but the authorities figured out who she was and she was sent to jail. Richard Bernstein, who was the first Time Magazine correspondent, did a story about a prison journal he got a hold of written by a democracy wall dissident who'd been jailed. Bernstein was called in for questioning by the police, and the dissident's sentence, which had been three years, was increased to 11 years. Still, Deng Xiaoping persisted with his reforms, which included uh, gradually greater engagement with the Western media. 
1986, for example, he gave an interview to Mike Wallace of the CBS 60 Minutes program. It was the uh, first time that a Chinese leader had actually sat down with a Western television journalist. But the reforming trends alarmed Communist Party hardliners who made repeated attempts to roll them back, partly by periodically rolling out campaigns against so-called bourgeois liberalization. Dorinda Elliott, who arrived in 1986 for Newsweek, tells a story of trying to interview a farmer in the countryside about one of these campaigns, and her experience gives a good sense of the challenges journalists faced then. And as a journalist, this was firstly no easy thing. You had to go through the foreign affairs office of the you know province, and then it got down to the town level, whatever. By the time I got to the village, I probably had twenty you know Chinese you know officials, Communist Party officials, following me. And I remember going into this farmer's house, and I'm trying to have a conversation with this farmer in Chinese. But in the meantime, you know like 15 or 20 government officials come into this tiny little house with me. And the entire village is basically looking through the window. <laughs> the, the farmer, the family of farmers are totally terrified, have no idea what's going on. So I turn to this woman and I say, so tell me, you know, what, what do you think about the bourgeois liberalization campaign and, and, you know, what's going on? And she says, she looks absolutely terrified, doesn't know what to say. And she says, well, the reason that we're supposed to support bourgeois liberalization is because, and you can see the officials saying, no, 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 you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to be opposing bourgeois liberalization. And, you know, I felt like, oh my God, what have I done to this poor farmer? We, we all had that kind of experience from time to time. In 1989, with the huge pro-democracy protests in Beijing's Tiananmen Square and elsewhere, uh, that became a watershed year, not only for China, but for the history of media coverage in China. Due to an accident of history, which is that the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev had been invited to Beijing to put an end to the 30-year-long Sino-Soviet dispute, the Chinese authorities wanted the summit, which was going to be the crowning achievement of Deng Xiaoping's uh, diplomatic career, uh, to be covered widely. And so they gave permission to CNN and other broadcasters to bring in uh, satellite dishes, which were big, cumbersome. Our, the CNN satellite dish was three meters. It was huge. And, and all sorts of other equipment to do live broadcasts. But what happened was that the students literally stole the stage on which the Sino-Soviet summit was supposed to take place. On the day of Gorbachev's arrival, for example, uh, CNN had gotten permission uh, for me and a camera crew to go live from the rostrum in Tiananmen Square, right above the Mao portrait, where Chairman Mao greeted the adoring Red Guards in the Cultural Revolution. But these were the scenes that we were broadcasting live rather than Gorbachev's uh, arrival. Uh, you know, and these live broadcasts, and today when it's possible to transmit live video from almost anywhere with an iPhone, uh, it's easy to lose sight of just how unprecedented this live coverage at the time was. Uh, and they captured attention around the world and they presented a picture of China utterly different from the narrative that the Chinese Communist Party had long sought to impose on foreign journalists. But on the night of June 3rd and 4th, the People's Liberation Army was called in to crush the protests. The following day from a balcony of the Beijing hotel, a CNN cameraman named Jonathan Scher and a photographer for the AP named Jeff Widener captured an image that became one of the iconic moments of, uh, of our time. Another cameraman said, hey, look at that guy in front of the tank. And I looked at it and said, oh my God, zoomed in on it and started videotaping. And they were trying to scare him off by shooting over his head. Well, shooting over his head was basically at, at where our position was. It was the fifth floor, the fourth floor, whatever balcony we were on, but the bullets were so close you could hear them whizzing by. And at that point, we just locked the camera down. It was just too dangerous. There were bullets ricocheting around. So I'm just like waiting for them to get shot and holding the focus on them, waiting and waiting. And it's too far away. And I just, this is too far away. It's too far away. And I look back at the bed and I had that lens doubler, which would make my 400 and 800. And I have to think, do, do I gamble? Do I go back to the bed? Maybe I lose the shot or do I just shoot this? wider. So I took a chance and I ran to the bed, got it, 
put it on the camera, open the aperture up all the way. One, two, three shots. That was the result, uh, an extraordinarily powerful image. Uh, and, and, and the picture of the man in front of the tank be became a symbol of a crackdown which shocked the world. And the coverage of Tiananmen more broadly produced a sea change in American perceptions of China. As the 1990s arrived, the U.S. press corps uh, in Beijing remained largely focused on the bitter legacy of 1989 and the atmosphere of repression that enveloped Beijing. But in such a climate, many reporters did not initially appreciate moves by Deng Xiaoping, most notably uh, his famous Southern Tour of 1992, uh, when, which was aimed at reviving his program of economic reform. But the attention of American journalists swiftly shifted to chronicling the dramatic economic, social, and even political changes triggered by the boom. The new atmosphere also led to a significant improvement in conditions for foreign journalists. It became much easier to travel. Local officials were much more accessible. Instead of chasing us away, they often asked American journalists for advice about how to attract foreign investment. By the late 1990s, the China beat was uh, entering what uh, Keith Richburg of the Washington Post described as its golden age. This is some amazing transformation that's going on in China right now. Beijing was kind of really exploding as uh, it went from being this kind of uh, difficult place for correspondents to live to being actually kind of fun. It was, in fact, an exhilarating period. The China's economy was turning into the manufacturing hub for the world, and American journalists were able to dig into Chinese society in ways that had previously been difficult, if not impossible, uh, trying to make sense of the paradoxes of a society where one day you'd be covering a jail dissident, and the next day you'd be covering the opening of the world's largest airport, or interviewing another Chinese entrepreneur who'd become a millionaire. 2008 was the climax of this period when Beijing hosted uh, the Summer Olympics. In the run-up to the games, the government lifted many long-standing restrictions on the movement and activities of foreign correspondents. But in the wake of the games, China's domestic political climate and its external behavior began to change. The financial crisis that rocked the West in 2008 and 2009 convinced Chinese leaders that the United States was a declining power and that the time was right for Beijing to show a more assertive face to the rest of the world, and that included its treatment of foreign media. For reporters, covering China became an increasingly difficult and tense game of cat and mouse with the authorities. Here's one example. The actor Christian Bale, the star of Batman and other movies, was in China uh, for uh, a premiere of a new film, and he wanted to meet Chen Guangcheng, the blind dissident lawyer who'd become known for helping the farmers in his village not far from Beijing and had been uh, detained under some kind of house arrest. Bale was accompanied by CNN correspondent Stan Grant as they tried to drive to Chen Guangcheng's village, but just outside they were set upon by local security personnel. Why can I, go, why can I not go visit this man? Hollywood actor Christian Bale is used to action. But this is no movie We've set. Been stopped. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Plain clothes, Chinese security who would not identify themselves, determined to stop him and our crew contacting a detained human rights activist. No, no, watch, watch, watch it, Christian. Watch. We're trying to get out of here. Once again, we've been stopped. We've been stopped right here. And as you can see, they're, they're pushing Christian here. We're just trying to leave peacefully. We're trying to leave peacefully. Government anger at the U.S. press intensified in 2012 when Michael Forsyth and his colleagues at Bloomberg News produced an expose showing that relatives of then Vice President Xi Jinping, who was about to become the top leader, had made millions of dollars in a host of businesses. At the same time, David Barboza of the New York Times used publicly available corporate documents to uncover how relatives of then Premier Wen Jiabao controlled numerous companies, and it also made millions of dollars. It's interesting to sort of hear his description of how he did that. Every time we requested a company, we found 10 more. So if you can imagine this big chart is you have like even with Ping An, behind Ping An are 30 companies, and then behind those, it ends up any company you look at is like 100 companies. I continued to map out a strategy of how to do it without setting off alarm bells, without letting people know, thinking about who was going to be translating, what I could show people. 
and also to go around to lawyers, accountants, bankers, and test some of the theories without giving them what I was doing because that was too sensitive. The stories broke new ground as examples of a new kind of investigative journalism for covering a rapidly changing China. The correspondents took advantage of China's evolution towards a more internationally engaged market-style economy to unravel complex and often hidden business dealings reaching to the highest levels in the People's Republic. Not surprisingly, retaliation from Beijing was swift. Michael Forsyth received death threats and had to leave China. The websites of both Bloomberg News and the New York Times were blocked, uh, and their reporters had trouble getting visas. Since then, China has become an increasingly challenging beat, as reporters have found themselves regularly tailed, harassed, blocked, and sometimes even physically assaulted. Xi Jinping's aggressive campaign to consolidate power has made conditions for journalists even more difficult. While not as bad as the Mao era, I would argue that the climate for China-based reporters is, is more restrictive now than at any time since the country began uh, the reform process and normalized relations with the U.S. in the late 1970s. At the same time, Xi Jinping has further tightened Communist Party control over Chinese society, and he changed party rules to allow him to, in effect, uh, stay in office for the rest of his life. High-level Chinese politics have always been opaque, secretive, and a challenge to figure out. But under Xi Jinping, they become even more so. Indeed, even though China is in some respects more accessible now than during the Mao years, Xi and other uh, senior officials hold meetings, they travel. Xi's even gone to Davos to address the World Economic Forum. But I would contend that our knowledge of the inner workings at the pinnacle of power in China is arguably less now than it was during Mao's time. American and other foreign journalists aren't alone in struggling to try and penetrate the wall of secrecy. Nonetheless, in more recent years, American journalists have persisted in doing what they could, and somewhat surprisingly, that has turned out to be quite a lot. It's included exposing the massive campaign of repression targeting the Uyghur Muslim population in the far western province of Xinjiang. This was coverage which helped make Chinese government behavior in Xinjiang into a major international issue. But conditions for reporters continued to deteriorate. In 2019, the Foreign Correspondents Club of China released a report in which 82% of the correspondents surveyed said they'd experienced uh, harassment or interference or violence while reporting, and 70% said they'd had interviews that they'd set up uh, canceled uh, due to uh, behavior of the Chinese authorities. During the early days of COVID, access uh, shrank further when nearly 20 journalists from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post were expelled. Those kicked out included Chow Dung of the Wall Street Journal and Chris Buckley of the New York Times. Both of them managed to slip into Wuhan just as the blackout was imposed, and they, uh, not the blackout, the lockdown, and they stayed through, throughout the time of the lockdown and did extremely important reporting uh, at, at the epicenter of COVID in the very earliest days of the pandemic. Beijing justified the expulsions as a response to a decision by the Trump administration to cap the number of visas um, at four state-run Chinese media outlets in the U.S., but the move decimated the U.S. press corps in China. With just a handful of reporters there now, that has largely meant having to cover China from outside the country. So a kind of modern day version of the art of China watching that emerged in Hong Kong in the 50s uh, and 60s has become increasingly important. Here, I wanna make a brief digression to recall the work of the man generally considered to in the field to have been the greatest of all the China watchers, Father Laszlo Ladani. Father Ladani was a Hungarian Jesuit priest who worked in China in the 1940s. After he had to leave following the communist revolution, he moved to Hong Kong. And for 30 years, he published a weekly newsletter called the China News Analysis. It became the Bible for multiple generations of journalists, myself included. The China News Analysis was based entirely on Father Ladani's reading and interpretation of the official Chinese media, newspapers, radio broadcasts, and so on. Ladani was fluent in Chinese, and he mastered the art of deciphering the real meaning behind the rhetoric, jargon, slogans, symbols, 
obscure historical references and dubious statistics pumped out by the Chinese Communist Party. This approach to analyzing China still holds true today. Here's a tweet by Carl Minzer of Fordham University, uh, a very, very good uh, China scholar, which provides an example of how to approach trying to make sense of what's going on now. Minzer charted the language used in the um, official state media references to Xi Jinping to see how often the term of Xi being at the helm or being the helmsman was used since that term uh, previously was used almost exclusively in references to Chairman Mao. So it was an interesting indication at the recent National People's Congress of the how strong Xi's grip on power was. But today there are resources and tools uh, beyond just trying to decipher the state-run media. These include the uh, monitoring the Chinese internet, which despite censorship can still provide critical insights. One recent example was this fascinating New York Times piece. Times reporters uh, went online and collected the publicly published obituaries uh, since January 2019 on the websites of the Chinese Academy of Engineering and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. They discovered that usually there were three or four obituaries every month. But once the Chinese government abandoned its zero COVID policy last December, the number of obituaries shot up dramatically. It was terrific reporting, and it provided powerful evidence that the government's official death toll um, from the ending of zero COVID did not reflect a much grimmer reality. Indeed, there are now a whole host of online publications exclusively devoted to following the Chinese internet and the Chinese media more broadly. They include What's on Weibo, which is run by a Dutch China specialist, which charts what's on the Chinese version of, of Twitter. It includes Cynicism, and the, the double entendre is deliberate, run by American China expert Bill Bishop, which offers summaries, analysis, links to Chinese media stories, and the China Media Project, which does um, something similar. Also increasingly important has been uh, commercially available satellite imagery, which was crucial in uncovering the detention camps in Xinjiang. More recently, reporters used uh, satellite images to document unusually high activity at crematoriums around China. Uh, this is a very interesting example. Um, if you look on the, this is a crematorium not far from Beijing. The photo on the left was taken in the beginning of December. The satellite photo on the right was taken at the end of December. And the only thing that happened between when the first and the second photograph was taken was that zero COVID was lifted. So it was yet another example of how reporters who could not physically be in China were able to document important things going on uh, using tools from outside. In addition, we're beginning to see the growing importance of AI, such as this newsletter published by two China watchers in Hong Kong called Five Things on China's Leaders' Minds. Uh, the newsletter uses software that can analyze web content for any keyword, sector, or individual to determine, how, to determine how often certain material appears. It's a way of showing what issues are preoccupying uh, uh, the top leadership and what they want officials uh, throughout the system to think about. Moreover, China's growing international involvement is also providing opportunities for reporters. One recent example was this long Wall Street Journal piece about problems in many high profile Chinese construction projects that are part of the country's highly publicized Belt and Road Initiative. The journal reporters talked to people in Peru, Pakistan, Uganda, Angola, and elsewhere. They also requested comment from Chinese embassies, companies, and the central government, but no one was willing to talk to them. And this cuts to one major issue that has long affected American and other foreign news coverage of China. And that's the continuing unwillingness of the Chinese authorities to engage in meaningful ways with reporters. As you can see from this example, and there are countless others, correspondents generally do try hard to get the Chinese perspective. But their requests for interviews and access are routinely rebuffed with the upshot that many stories do not contain as extensive or nuanced a portrayal of Chinese views or Chinese thinking. But that is almost invariably the result of official Chinese unwillingness to engage. It is not, I would argue, a function of bias, despite the claims one often hears from Beijing and its supporters about how the Western media is biased, that it's anti-China, that has, it has an agenda to defame China, and so on. In fact, as I tried to indicate, 
Responsible reporters want to get input from all sides on important stories, but they have to do their jobs and they'll end up putting out their story with whatever material they can get by the time their deadline rolls around. If the Chinese side won't engage, it has only itself to blame. But there's another reason for the tension between the American slash Western press and the Chinese authorities, and that has to do with the nature of journalism itself. At its finest, journalism here in the States or in the West more generally has functioned to sort of shine a light in dark places, to hold the powerful accountable, to be a voice for the voiceless. And that's as true for a correspondent, whether he or she is in Beijing or Washington or London or Moscow or Nairobi or Delhi. And that's why so many governments around the world don't like the press. But in fact, it's also worth noting that this is not just a Western notion. In Asia, for example, you have a relatively free press in Japan, in South Korea, in Taiwan. You had it in Hong Kong until China imposed its draconian national security law. You even have it in the Philippines, where my old friend and longtime CNN colleague Maria Reza won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for reporting on issues the authorities there didn't want covered. So it's, in my view, not a function of the press being, quote, anti-China. Indeed, I would argue that most of the journalists who appear in assignment China really like China. For them, China was a passion. It was a calling. I know that was certainly true in my case. I was entranced with China long before I became a journalist. In fact, I became a journalist because I was fascinated by China and because back in the mid-1970s when I started out and it was very, very hard for Americans to go to China, being a journalist seemed to be one of the few career paths that might actually allow an American to get to the People's Republic. Indeed, most journalists who spend the time to learn Chinese, uh, to study the country and agree to live there and bring their families there in spite of all the difficulties, don't do it because they hate China. They do it because they like it, because they're fascinated by it. They want to experience it. Indeed, I think one of the most unfortunate consequences of the sharp drop in American media access to China is the ability of reporters who are basically positively inclined towards the Chinese people to go around the country, to talk to folks, to witness for themselves uh, what's going on. That, that ability has been so severely limited. Being there is the essential foundation for good journalism, and this has just become harder and harder to do. In addition, when travel has been possible, the few reporters still on the ground in China face a populace who, after years of being told by the state media that foreign journalists are bad, that they're spies, that they, 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 they should be kept at arm's length, are, even without the officials pressuring people not to talk, reluctant to engage with reporters, uh, if not downright hostile. So the result is that more and more of the coverage is becoming focused on the tensions and conflicts driving the U.S. and China apart. Since the official statements, the diplomatic back and forth, the military posturing is usually easier to follow and report on. But what's increasingly missing is the ability of journalists to convey the richness and humanity of the world's most populous nation, uh, convey a sense of the shared humanity that I think is also absolutely crucial to understand, especially so at this time, as the U.S. and China seem to be lurching ever closer to confrontation. So let me stop there. Thanks for your attention. And uh, we've got some time for discussion and Q&A. OK, thank you. That's great. And you had we were going to give you one more minute, but you didn't use it. So that's good. You yeah. know, I was a TV reporter. I would have a producer in my ear say 30 seconds, 15 <laughs> seconds, cut, cut, cut. So I know how to do this. Okay. So what we want to do, we do have time now for questions. Um, and I would only, or we want to hear as many voices as possible. So, so please keep your question relatively short and uh, we'll get as many questions in as possible. And we're going to do this for uh, 16 minutes at least. Uh, but uh, show of hands, if you're interested, I ask you to speak nice and loud so everybody can hear you. Uh, who wants to get the ball rolling? Barry Naughton. Hey, looking back, what would you say you got most wrong at the time? What would we say? What did, what did we get most wrong? Uh, where do you want me to begin? <laughs> uh, I, I, I would turn it around and say, I think there are lots of specific things, specific episodes that people 
got wrong. I remember uh, after uh, the, the gang of four were purged, for example, a wire service, which shall remain nameless, which was in the same building in Hong Kong as the CBS Bureau, saw, uh, I think it was a Shinra report saying uh, that uh, a bane had been liquidated from the Communist Party and put out a bulletin saying China executes Mao's widow because he interpreted liquidated to mean <laughs> physically liquidated. Um, after uh, in 1989, there were a flurry of rumors about uh, civil war, that the army was fracturing. And there's no question there were tensions, but there were some reporters who actually portrayed it that way and it was wrong. But, but stepping back, have, overall, and, and having reviewed enormous amounts of the coverage over many decades, what struck me was not how much people got wrong, but given the limitations and the obstacles, how much of it they basically got right, at least on the sort of broad strokes, the, the, the broad contours of the political battles and the Cultural Revolution, for example, or the, the succession to Mao uh, or around 1989. Um, were, I would say, if you look back, it was probably more right than wrong. Um, and given that you can't like just call up the central committee and get a quote or something like that, and you're so much of it is guesswork and there's so many obstacles, um, I, I I would say that that they, they did better than one might reasonably expect, despite the many things that the many specific things that were wrong. You focused early on about the centrality of Hong Kong in when it was not easy or even possible to get access to China for, for journalists. Uh, and then you went through the various phases of access to China, sometimes good, sometimes not so good, sometimes awful. Um, is Taiwan going to become the new place where actual journalists live and work to try to do the China story? Yes, sort of, I guess is the answer to that. There are quite a number of journalists who were in China uh, and had to leave or kicked out or who want to go to China and can't get in who are in Taiwan. Taiwan has the advantage that it is a Chinese speaking society. There is still a reasonable amount of back and forth, um, but it's not the only place and it doesn't have the advantages that Hong Kong had. There's not quite the same extensive uh, interconnectedness uh, that you would get in Hong Kong. So it's, it's, it's scattered. There are people in Taiwan, there are people in Seoul, there's a whole cottage industry of China watching in, in Washington now. Um, some of it, some of it quite good, some of it, some of it less so. Um, but we're, everybody's having to make do with the fact that it's so hard to be on the ground and see for yourself. And that just, you know, makes the one struggle harder to get half as much uh, of, of an accurate picture. And there's just, there's so much we don't know about what's happening in Chinese society. We didn't know that much when we were there because 1.4 billion people, even if you have 14 reporters as the New York Times did before the expulsions, yeah. you can't do much. Now they have two, so how can you be sure? So I, I worry that we're missing a lot of really important cross currents in Chinese society or getting just fragmentary information about and, it. And where are you based now? I'm based in Taiwan. <laughs> Questions? Yes, please. That, uh, Mike is coming your way. So many of us in this room, unsurprisingly, are probably looking forward to careers related to China in journalism, in academia, whatever. Um, and certainly being a China watcher these days is very popular, and it's the easiest thing in the world to be a very bad China watcher. Since you've made a career of this and you've known many others who have, how do you think those of us looking at that potential career can be better and not worse China watchers, assuming that we have to do this from a distance? Um, read, 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 read. <laughs> um, uh, I would go back and reread all of Father Ladani's China news analysis. That's absolutely just just for to learn. I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious here. It's, it's, it is, it's available. Um, Read, study, talk to as many people as possible, get as uh, uh, knowledgeable about the history of the language, the politics, the culture. Um, you know, be humble, be, be aware that the lang that, that um, language is used in the Chinese Communist Party context. Words like democracy, for example, have completely different meaning. So, so um, 
there's a certain amount of it's like wire service reporting or China Today said this or did that. Um, to, to sort of get below the surface, you have to really have a better understanding of how you based on there's enough out there about how it has historically worked that I think there are lessons to apply. But it's a long, hard, often mind numbingly boring slog and you don't get the same gratification that you get of plopping yourself down in a Chinese village for a week mm -hmm. and seeing what's going on. But don't give up because A, it's crucially important. And B, I think one of the things that worries me now is that the, the job options for people uh, with the sort of China interest uh, not being able to go to China are going to be increasingly in the sort of security, military, you know, strategic. And that's really, really important. But uh, it, it, the danger of it sort of tilting so much in that direction that you lose sight of trying to understand the deeper cross currents in the society, which will affect political behavior by the Communist Party, um, is a real problem, which, which can be slightly addressed by doing the kind of things that you're interested in that I'm talking about. Great questions, more voices. Elaine Wang. So uh, after being in China for so long, what was your most memorable experience and what was the craziest uh, adventure you've been on? The, the, the craziest adventure or experience In China had? or in my journalistic career? Uh, both. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. The craziest is probably my lunch with Kim Il-sung in North Korea. You have to read my other books to learn about that. Um, you know, I think I have to be honest that Tiananmen Square is the story that stands out for all the obvious reasons. I mean, it was an extraordinary moment for China and to sort of see, I mean, we all knew there were cross currents in Chinese society that we were sort of aware of, but we couldn't kind of reach out and touch and feel. And because of what happened, it was like peeling layers of an onion back and you suddenly got to see all the stuff boiling below the surface. So to be able to do that without the government stopping you for a period of time was remarkably interesting in terms of insights about China. And of course, as kind of pioneering moment in, in, in journalism and then all the stuff that, that followed. So um, that has to be the sort of the story that, that sticks. And of course, also June 4th is my birthday, which means that <laughs> Which means that every year for the however many years till I left CNN, I had I had to do, I had to work on my birthday doing Tiananmen anniversary <laughs> stories. <laughs> yes, please. First of all, I, I think that's a wonderful perspective of your doing as a journalist about journalism. And so I want to compliment you on that. And it you talked about Hong Kong, and I have the dubious distinction of having first gone to Hong Kong in 1948, Ooh. and I remembered it. And I also remember when all the Walla Wallas were out so far in the bay that the ships couldn't even come in. And so it's just so hard to believe that the spirit of Hong Kong has been totally decimated. And I wondered if you had any particular thoughts other than um, exodus and other things that have happened. Uh, is there anything left of that unique Hong Kong spirit? Well, there are still 7 million Hong Kongers there, and they proved themselves to be pretty resourceful survivors over the years. Um, and I think China still wants Hong Kong to function economically, but uh, it's a pretty sobering experience to be living in a relatively free society and to simply see those freedoms systematically squeezed out by the actions of uh, the authorities uh, dictated by Beijing, to see many people who were sources that I interviewed or sort of important political, academic, intellectual, social figures in Hong Kong languishing in jail, and to have this law that essentially gives the authorities the, the right to criminalize almost anything that one may say or do or read or tweet, um, it's very chilling. And I think a lot of people who care about that are, are deeply distressed. There's a, the, the numbers show uh, much larger numbers of Hong Kongers leaving, certainly a fair number of foreigners, particularly those dealing with those, that, those kinds of issues are leaving. But a lot of people are staying. I know some people who have, are saying, uh, I'll take them at their word. I'm not 
advocating Hong Kong independence. So I'm going to carry on and up to them to stop me. We'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Um, we haven't had an episode yet like the two Michaels, the two Canadians who were detained unjustly for almost three years in the mainland, but that's the kind of thing that's on people's minds now. So it's 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 uh, it's very sad to see that the, that quality of Hong Kong that made it so special uh, has really been lost. Even though if you got off the plane, it would still seem like the same incredibly exciting, vibrant place. And in some respects it is, but in that crucial respect, it's not. That's why I mentioned earlier when I introduced Mike about our affection for Hong Kong uh, in the 70s. We spent so much time there. Uh, the last time I saw this guy was in 2019, early October. I was passing through Hong Kong and the demonstrations were on. And he said, let me take you where you have to go to see what's really happening on both sides, especially on the Hong Kong side. And he took me to places where from the vantage point, you could see no exaggeration tens of thousands of demonstrators, including little kids in school uniforms. Uh, and uh, it was just, it, 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 ha it had that kind of painful yeah. impact on me as well. Uh, now, Lei is looking at uh, some of our uh, virtual uh, viewers' questions, and he's going to summarize maybe a couple of those questions. Um, there's a question actually from someone that you know. This is uh, Mary Louise Grow who said you met in 1990 at the um, celebration of uh, Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wudan's Pulitzer Prize in their apartment. But here's the question from her, uh, not so much about journalists, but about your views on what might be able to lead to a reset in the very negative US-China relationship. I wish I had a good answer. Um... I'm, I find it very worrisome. Um, I think, you know, both sides have this narrative that the other is 100% to blame for what's going on. Um, my own view is the, re the, the reality is that um, Chinese behavior over the last dozen or so years has been the sort of catalyst for a rethink that is also unfortunately on the US side uh, triggered some more extreme uh, behavior and, uh, and become an outlet for certain kinds of racial prejudices and you know to see congressmen falling over themselves about who can be tougher on China. So I'm not convinced that the American response to valid challenges from China mm -hmm. that require a response is being done particularly intelligently. Um, and the problem is that uh, the communication channels are, are really uh, fragile at the moment. There's very little communication. Um, the fact that the Chinese defense minister wouldn't take a call from the American Secretary of Defense when the balloon episode happened, I thought was very, very telling. You, you hear this all the time that, that uh, there's no, there's very little back channel communication. There isn't a a Henry Kissinger-esque figure that can be sent quietly. I mean, for example, after Tiananmen, uh, President, uh, first President Bush sent Lawrence Eagleburger, who was the Deputy Secretary of State, and Brent Scowcroft, his National Security Advisor, on a secret trip to Beijing uh, about a month later to say, we, despite all of this stuff, and we don't approve of what you did, we still need to find a way to prevent the relationship from going off the rails. Um, but there it's the, the Chinese don't seem in a mood to talk and the, the politics on both sides are extremely poisonous right now, the domestic politics. So I think it would be very hard for either side to take a step. Um, even though I think Biden and Xi Jinping would like to avoid, you know, the ultimate clash. And in fact, you know, this, the balloon incident is a classic example of what I call the cock up theory of international relations. It was an accident. The balloon went off course. The Biden administration tried to not make it public until people saw it floating over the Midwest and took pictures of it. Then when it came out what it was, there was this huge media outcry. And so they had to shoot it down. And then that torpedoed the Secretary of State going to China. So I'm deeply worried. And yeah. if they don't find channels to communicate, um, that's very problematic. And another casualty of this is the non-official channels, the journalistic exchanges, the student exchanges, the yeah. academic with the people to people connections, which are important and have been a, a kind of a glue that helps the whole thing from 
stops the, helps stop the whole thing from coming apart is also becoming much more problematic. So I, all I would say is I don't have a solution and it worries me greatly. Talk about the balloon. New York Times today, did you see it? Two massive pages about the mapping the balloon oh, really? from I-9 all the way through Alaska down in just devoted that much space. Uh, let's take so, one more. Um, is there one more that they take one more? I, I have one a more question too. That. I didn't get there. My question. Okay. You, you got Can another I, one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this question is about the common Chinese perception of the Western media, quote unquote, of being very negative. Mm -hmm. right? Inside China, everybody was talking about right. Zheng Liang in a positive reporting and everything that there's a particular spin on that. But what do you think of how do you help the Chinese people, ordinary Chinese people to understand where the Western journalists come from? And because after all, you have to devote a certain scarce resources, you know, pages to reporting something about China, you're selecting the story. So they will say, why didn't you, you know, report a lot of the good things that are happening? or more good things about right. China, but right. then focusing on all the negatives. Right. I mean, that's the perception. Right. How do you help the Chinese people to understand that? Well, they could all read my book, which will be coming out in Chinese. Uh, 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 Taiwanese publishers bringing it out the end. Simplify Simplify Chinese. But seriously, there's 125 plus journalists yeah. talking about how they covered China. What did you do when you were the Associated Press correspondent in Nanjing and the Red Army rolled in? How did you sit in Hong Kong and make sense of the Cultural Revolution? What was it like if you were Barbara Walters flying on the press plane to China with Nixon? What was it like being Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times uh, bicycling, in, bicycling into Tiananmen Square on the night of June 4th? What was it like going to Xinjiang? So I, I honestly, I'm not, I'm not just trying to promote my book, but that's part of the reason why I did the book is to give people the tools to, to hear from folks in their own words what it's like. Beyond that, though, I do think there's an issue about uh, it's not the role of the journalist to promote good relations or promote bad relations. The role of the journalist is to cover news and to try and convey as accurately as they can a kind of a, a sense of what's going on in the society. In my view, journalism is a craft and it has certain values, and that includes trying to be fair and trying to put your personal politics or ideas or you know likes or dislikes aside but the reality is that um news is not just good news news is all the news and um one of the problems is the chinese communist party's idea of news is only good news and if they were brave enough to accept that you know a 50 50 balance of bad of, of quote unquote more negative news would be balanced by more positive news, which I think would be the result if people had much more unfettered access. You yeah. get that, but in that system, what official is gonna be the one to risk saying, you allowed 50% negative coverage when Chairman C says we can't have any negative coverage. So I think it's, it's, it's a problem. And uh, you know, if we're not allowed to go, and, and also the state media has spent several years saying that every journalist is a spy and is an agenda, and I, that's categorically untrue. Um, and I think if you read this book, you get a sense of it, but it's gonna be hard to convince people of it if they don't have access to independent information. Okay, um, so um, great questions. Uh, there are goodies I know outside that I wanna get you access to soon, but I wanna say a couple of final words. Uh, we've been spending all this time talking about uh, Assignment China. Uh, I've read, sorry? Oh, one more question. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks for sharing your great insight about uh, China's um, China as the journalist. My question is pretty simple. So when you when you hanging out with your counterparty, uh, 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 mainland China journalist in a bar or in a Beijing mm -hmm. or Shanghai, wherever. So how do you see their uh, your counterparty part? How do you see the their reporting style? Yeah, like a, well, what did you see you. there? Good, good, good question. Um, I think it's it, it it has depended on the on the uh, political climate at the time. There are any number of very good Chinese journalists. Uh, there are Chinese journalists who want to do journalism as I would define journalism, as opposed to how the Chinese Communist Party would define journalism. There are plenty who have come and studied journalism 
uh, in the West uh, and have gone back and have uh, the, the skill set, how much they're able to use it has been varied. Uh, pol political coverage, very, very little. There were periods when more independent economic coverage was possible. We always used to feel the Chinese journals knew a lot but couldn't publish very much, whereas we didn't know very much, could publish anything. And so they were often very good sources, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, those kinds of contacts are increasingly problematic, but if China ever reverses course again, and there've been enough shifts in the history of the People's Republic that it's not impossible that it could happen, there will be people who have that skill set and, 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 and those values and ideas who could play a role, but at the moment, unfortunately, they're not allowed to do so. Okay, uh, so um, we've been talking about Assignment China. Uh, really appreciate all of uh, Mike's remarks. I wanna say a couple of final words. Uh, and I preface all of this by saying, he already knows that I'm a wise guy. So I'm gonna be able to get away with what I'm about to do because I have a gift for Mike. He okay. doesn't oh, don't look yet. I have a gift for Mike because there's another book called Assignment China. Oh, I'm gonna get sued? And I'm holding it right in my hands here. It was published 67 years ago. I won't get sued. <laughs> <laughs> it was published 67 years ago in 1956. I think you might still have been in diapers I, at yes, that point. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. So here's the story and it's all true. Way back in 1971, when I made my first visit to China in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, I met a former American journalist who was living in China. One of the very, very few who had worked as a journalist in China for a couple of years after the 1949 revolution. His name was Julian Schumann. I know you know the name. Uh, he is the one who wrote a book called Assignment China. <laughs> there it is. He wrote a book called Assignment China back in 1956. The two books have the same title, but they are completely different. Schumann's book offers a single one-dimensional voice, his own, and covers only the three years before and the three years after the 1949 revolution. Mike's new book, uh, as he just mentioned, gives us access, I counted them, well over 130 complex and fascinating journalistic voices and covers almost 80 years of twists and turns and debates in uh, among US uh, uh, journalists who struggled to report on ever-changing developments in China. And that's why I strongly recommend this book to you. It's a great book. Uh, Schumann's book, Assignment China, is at best a funky antique. And I'm an historian and historians collect rare books. That's one of the things we do. We all have our rare book collections. And the copy I have is actually signed by Julian Schumann. Wow. Oh, that's very cool. And I want to give it to you. Thank you so much. Also, I have a more colorful cover. <laughs> so thanks to everybody for coming. This was a wonderful, wonderful session. And uh, there's food and drink out there. And but books. the most important thing, there are books out there. And, and there aren't many of them. He's going to sign them. And it'll go on for the next 20, 25 minutes. Then we have a dinner appointment. Thank you all. Thanks a lot.